Hello, everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon um, for our webinar on feeding of infants and children, focusing on behavioural aspects. Um, we're thoroughly looking forward to what I think will be a really interesting half an hour and uh, hope you are too. So um, I'm Francis and I have my colleague Alex with me and Alex is on the chat box and uh, he might be answering any questions you have as we go along that he can answer but if you've got any questions particularly for Marion please do put those in the chat box as well and we'll make a note of those and we can talk through those later on with Marion. Um, please make sure that you've actually set your chat box to panellists and attendees. If you've just got panellists it just means that um, me in the office and Marion we can actually see your comments and nobody else can so um, if you can do it to put all panellists and attendees, that would be great. And just a couple of um, housekeeping things before we move on. So the webinar is being recorded and will be available for future use. Um, so what we'll do is we will upload it to YouTube and also to the Food of Act of Life website. Um, as I said before, if you've got any questions, please put them in the chat box. And then at the end of the webinar, you'll be redirected to a short online evaluation. It will only take you about a minute to do. And then once you've done that, you'll then be directed to a downloadable certificate. So what we'll do at the end is we will end the meeting. And at that point, you'll be directed to the evaluation. If by any chance it doesn't happen, we will be sending out an email tomorrow with the link to the evaluation. So you will get that. So um, we're now ready, actually, for Marion to start. So Marion, you have control of the screen and uh, looking forward to your webinar. OK, thank you, Francis. And thank you to the BNF for the uh, opportunity to talk about our research on feeding infants and children. Um, I hope uh, that everyone can hear me OK. And what I want to do is to focus on a particular food group one that children seem to have a lot of difficulty with, which is namely vegetables. So in our research, uh, we do a lot of work with uh, looking at infant uh, behaviours in response to vegetables and also preschool children uh, and their behaviour towards vegetables. So today what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about our research and try to uh, illuminate some strategies that have been tested and that seem to be quite useful for encouraging children to eat more veg. Um, so I'm just going to try and uh, go to the next slide, which is that I'm going to be focusing on children's uh, facial expressions for part of this, um, uh, this seminar. Um, and also uh, want you to bear in mind that uh, although children sometimes have a dislike or disgust um, a facial expression to vegetables, they're actually very willing to try vegetables early on in life. So in this webinar, um, I'm hoping to talk to you about why campaigns to increase vegetable intake for children might raise awareness, but they don't necessarily change behaviour. And I also want to remind us all that infants are born very wise uh, and they're very wise about flavours uh, and they avoid bitterness at the beginning of life, but they accept um, bitterness as a function of experience. Um, so I'm going to ask the question, why don't children like vegetables? And one of my colleagues, Kays de Graaf, in Wageningen University says, children are hardwired not to like vegetables. So we're going to talk a little bit today about why children don't like veg and what we can do to help them to accept vegetables so that when they see broccoli, they don't look away and they don't uh, avoid them. So there are campaigns to encourage children to eat more veg. Most recently, we have the Eat Them to Defeat Them, uh, the Veg Power Story, uh, More Peas Please. And we've had in the UK the Eat Five a Day um, campaign for many years. And most parents are very much aware of the five a day uh, mantra. Uh, and they're very much aware of what they should be doing in terms of recommendations. But as a psychologist, I know that there's a vast difference between knowledge and behaviour. People know what they should do, but actually enacting that behaviour is quite difficult. And in particular, with something like vegetables, it's particularly difficult because some veg are quite bitter. Some veg don't taste so good or they don't look so good or they've got a texture that's not pleasant. And in some countries, um, they even have 
seven a day as their portion uh, target. So this is a, a, a slide from Australia, go for two and five, two fruits and five portions of vegetables a day. But really around the world, very few children are making that recommendation of eating five a day, let alone seven a day. Why do we want to promote vegetable intake? Well, I'm sure you're all aware that um, vegetables have a particular benefit to health in that um, long term consumption of fruits and vegetables protect against cancer, heart disease, type 2 diabetes and some evidence of protection against cognitive decline in older adults. And that's because vegetables and fruits contain phytochemicals such as phenolic acids, flavonoids, organosulfur compounds and carotenoids. And these all have antioxidant action and they also have tumour suppressant effects. So um, epidemiological studies in humans show that beta carotene and vitamin C rich fruits and vegetables are associated with a lower risk of coronary heart disease. And in particular, vegetables are more protective to health than fruit. Um, and the benefits of eating a large number of portions per day have been reported. So it's really the quantity, uh, not just the variety. In fact, quantity is more important than variety of fruits and vegetables uh, linked to lower risk of coronary heart disease. So why don't children like vegetables and how do we know that they don't like vegetables? Well, in this study by Charlotte Evans, my colleague here at the University of Leeds, they did a meta-analysis which included 21 school-based studies trying to get children to eat more fruits and vegetables. And in this meta-analysis, they compressed the data for, for more than 24,000 children across these 21 uh, school-based studies. And across these different studies, when you look at them all together, on average, there was an improvement of a quarter portion a day of fruit and veg intake, if you exclude fruit juice. But of that improvement, vegetables accounted for only 0.07 uh, of a portion. So interventions that are based on schools with school aged children show a selective improvement of fruit but not vegetable intake. And my question is, by the time kids get to school, is it too late to learn? And certainly we find it much more difficult to change the eating habits of school aged children than we do in the preschool um, period and particularly in infancy. So I'm going to talk a little bit about infancy and the early years. So infants are born very wise. They are born as univores and they have to become omnivores uh, to ensure that they get the sufficient nutrients that they need for growth and well-being. And they are born to like one single food. So that's milk at the beginning of life, which is slightly sweet. So if you give a child a sweet flavour, they don't need to learn about it. They are already hardwired to accept sweet tastes. So they have the innate capacity to like sweetness. But if you look at the slides below the, the picture of the tongue protrusion, this is the response to bitter. Bitterness is disliked. So infants are born wise because bitterness in nature can sometimes indicate a toxin or that something has gone off or something is not good for you. And therefore, children are born very wise to like sweetness, to dislike bitterness. But the other thing that children can do is they can learn through their experience. So they learn through mimicking and modelling what others around them are doing. And they learn through experience of touching and feeling and seeing um, the different fruit, fruits and vegetables, um, even something that's very novel. Now, if we look at the first tastes that infants have, we know that their facial responses are very informative. So in this slide, I've presented data from Jakob Steiner from the 1970s. And these are newborn babies who have not yet had a milk feed. So they've had a droplet of sucrose in solution, citric acid in solution, and then also quinine sulfate in solution. And what you can see is that with the sweet taste, babies have a smile, have a positive affective response. Uh, to the sour citric acid, they have a lip pursing response. And then to bitter, they have a gape. And this gape 
uh, emits the liquid from the mouth, so ejects the liquid from the mouth. So babies are born to dislike bitterness and they acquire a liking for bitterness through exposure. And we share this liking of sweetness and this dislike of bitterness with other animals. So other non-human primates like the orangutan have a similar response to sweetness and the gape in response to bitter. And even the humble rat has the same response to sweetness and bitterness. So these taste aversions, tastes, likes are really strong from birth. And what we want to do is we want to get beyond the dislike of bitter to acceptance of bitter tastes. So in this study by Clara Davis from the 1920s, 1930s, this was a study which allowed us for the first time to understand what children would choose if they have a variety of foods to choose from. Now this study would never get past an ethics uh, committee these days because these were all infants who were fed in the hospital where they resided and all of their meals were weighed. Everything that they ate was weighed. Everything that they chose was recorded. And you can see on this slide that the babies were actually given a tray of foods and the nurse sat by very stoically saying not very much uh, so that the infants were able to choose what they wanted. Now, if children are born to like sweet taste and to avoid bitterness, if they were given a variety of foods, what would they choose? And on the right hand side of the slide, you can see the foods used in the experiment. And these were raw and cooked versions of all these different foods. There were no combined foods like soups or custards or even bread, but rather these were raw and cooked um, fruits and vegetables, cereals, etc. So what would the children do? Would the children just go for the oranges and the bananas and the apples, things that were tasty and uh, you know, uh, sweet? Or would they combine lots of different foods together? Well, in this next slide, you can see an example of a breakfast of a, a 12 month old um, at 7 a.m. And what they were choosing uh, was a variety of foods. So you can see that there's some milk, some raw apple, and in a lot more cooked apple, because it's a lot easier for a one-year-old to eat a, a cooked apple than a raw apple. There's some orange juice in there. There's cooked wheat, cooked barley, cooked liver, cooked sweetbreads in small amounts. But still, this is a very wholesome breakfast, uh, covering a lot of different nutrients. And for the same child at five o'clock for supper, here they're having milk again, some delicious bone jelly, <laughs> uh, some fish, a cooked egg, some banana, orange segments, 10 grams of raw oats, which as a Scottish person, I'm delighted to see the child choosing oats, but even I as a Scottish person wouldn't eat them raw. And here we see that the child is eating 56 grams of cooked oats. So clearly the cooked oats are preferred because they're easier to consume. So what this little study does is it tells us that um, Clara Davis is showing uh, that the babies are wise. They're not just choosing the sweet or the favoured foods. And I should have added that these were babies from six months who were then studied for several years, some of them up until the age of six years. And what the children did was they ate a variety of different foods and they kept very healthy very well. And of course, uh, Clara Davis reports in her study that each infant in the beginning chose some foods which they then spat out. Later on, this did not happen. So the children tried a little bit of everything and then they went back to the foods through a process of learning, learning about the foods um, through exposure. So we've done a series of studies with weanling children, children who are ready to have solid foods at around five and a half months of age. That age was chosen by the mums. And what we wanted to do was we wanted to find out what would happen if we could combine vegetable flavours in very early life, just at the very beginning of solid food introduction. And we were inspired by interviews that we conducted with mothers from Dijon and from Lyon. And in these interviews, the French mum said that when they were ready to introduce solid foods, they wanted their babies to have foundations of taste, uh, meaning that they wanted them to learn a little bit about all different tastes that were part of the French diet, and in particular vegetables. And what they did was they boiled vegetables in uh, water and they took some of that water out of the vegetables that they were boiling 
and cooking, and then they added it to breast milk or they added it to formula just to see if the children would like that flavour of the vegetable but with milk. So this was anecdotal evidence from mum. So we developed a trial to test this strategy out to find out if adding vegetable flavours to milk might encourage children to like vegetables. So the mums in our trial were randomised to an intervention group or a control. And the intervention infants received 12 days of vegetables added to breast milk or to formula, then 12 days uh, of the vegetable added to baby rice. So they had 24 days of build up until they then had a vegetable puree. And when they had that pure uh, vegetable puree, we filmed their response to that in the control group and in the intervention group. And the mums chose the time at which they wanted to uh, start the trial. And that choice was around five and a half months of age when the mums decided their babies were ready for a taste of vegetables added to milk. So the design of the study was that we had breastfeeding mums and formula feeding mums. And for 12 days in the control group, it was the, the normal milk. But in the intervention group, they were given around 50 grams maximum of different vegetables every day. So carrot, green beans, spinach, broccoli, and then that again on rotation. So for 12 days, once a day, they would have some vegetable added to milk. And then after that 12 days, the control group had plain rice, but in the intervention group, twice a day, the babies would have carrot, green beans, spinach, or broccoli added to the baby rice so that it was uh, a nice strong flavor, but added to something that was quite bland, baby rice made up with uh, mum, mum's milk. And then finally, on days 25 and 26, we filmed the babies getting their first taste of carrot, first taste of green bean in the control group, and the carrot green bean in the intervention group who'd already had these flavours, but they'd had them in milk or they'd had them in rice. And we filmed them again at days 33, 34 and 35. So when we filmed the babies, we were asking mums to feed their baby the pure vegetable and asked to stop when they had observed their baby refusing three consecutive spoonfuls. So mums were given training in how to identify refusal. So if the, if the baby looks like this, <laughs> or the baby looks away, or really turns the head away, then that, that's enough. They don't have to be fed any more of the vegetable. So we rated liking from the mothers, we rated liking from researchers, and we rated liking by researchers not involved in the study. And then we looked at the facial and behavioural responses, and we uh, measured how much was consumed in that meal. And just to show you what a one spoon sequence looks like, here's a baby ready for her spoonful of vegetable. She's opening the mouth wide to receive the vegetable and really wide again. Now the vegetable is in the mouth and you can see that the, the eyebrows are furrowed slightly. Um, and here we have nose wrinkling. And here we have the, the corners of the mouth, uh, the lips are turned down um, and even the eyebrows are squinched together. So in a single spoon, you can see this a variety of facial expressions in response to the flavor of the vegetable in the mouth. And here's a, a little bit of vegetable coming out at the other end and then the baby is being offered another spoonful. And what's interesting is despite that facial expression, the baby is ready again to receive that spoon. So sometimes mums might interpret that as dislike, but actually they're just uh, dealing with the flavor for the first time and they might just be a little bit surprised by the flavor rather than it being dislike. So in our study, the intervention group ate more of the carrots and more of the green bean than the controlled uh, condition. And so what we find is that the intervention group were much more willing to try vegetables and to eat more of the pure vegetables because they'd had experience with those vegetables in the preceding 24 days. So we've published this paper and you can have a look uh, if you're interested. And what's also interesting is that the babies in the intervention group had a higher rate of acceptance of the vegetable when it was offered to them. So they ate more and they ate faster because they really seemed to like the vegetable. And because we also looked at their behaviours, like negative behaviours or positive behaviours, we know that um, there were differences, not just by group, but also by vegetable. So green beans, even in the intervention group, there's slightly more negative behaviors than for carrot. Now carrots are slightly sweet. 
So this explains why behaviours are a lot more positive to carrots, but in the control group, there were more negative behaviours in the control group, even to carrots. So carrots, uh, it being uh, exposed to carrots early on in the weaning process, it seems to be very important. And similarly with facial expressions, these are negative facial expressions, much higher for green bean than for carrot, and much higher of uh, negative facial expressions amongst the control group. And just to show you, some of the behaviours, this is baby turning away. So these behaviours are important because they correspond to how much is consumed. And um, when baby looks down like this, they they really have had enough. And we're now using this material to help with responsive feeding because we think this material is very useful for teaching mums about responsive feeding and about how to interpret um, what their babies are telling them in terms of appetite and liking and disliking. We've also done uh, another European-based study um, in the days when European money was freely available to the British. Um, and we did an experiment across different countries with different vegetables, either at weaning ages or at slightly above. So we had uh, learning studies from six months up to three years of age. And we used a weaning study where vegetables were introduced at solid food introduction, comparing vegetables with fruits. And we also did a study here with artichoke and with different types of vegetable soups, as well as freeze-dried um, vegetables such as beetroot. And in these different experiments, we were looking at the different ways that children learn to accept and like vegetables. And one of the main ways that children learn to like vegetables is through exposure. And it has to be between eight to 10 exposures before children like those uh, vegetables. So we did quite an intensive study with artichoke, and I, I wanna talk a little bit more about that now. But I just wanted to put this slide together to say that we were interested in maternal feeding practices, maternal characteristics such as body mass index, as well as children's eating traits such as food fussiness. And you might think, well, how do you know a baby's fussy if they're only six months old? But actually these uh, traits are highly heritable. So you see evidence of food fussiness really early on because it's highly heritable. So this is a study of artichokes, which is a really novel um, vegetable for most children. And we had the same crop, the same harvest of artichokes, which was then processed into a puree. And then we distributed it to Denmark, to the UK and also to France. And we compared um, artichoke intake uh, across these three different countries, either plain or with a little bit of added sugar, since children like sweet taste, or with a little bit of oil because we know that children sometimes eat their vegetables with a little bit of olive oil and that gives energy and it also gives flavour. And just to show you what individual eating patterns look like, I've put this slide together just to show you that some children, even with 10 exposures, are not eating very much. Whereas some children, they only need two exposures and then they'll eat a lot. Um, and some children like the artichoke right from the very beginning. So it's really important to remember, even though I'm looking at data across three different countries, around two and a half to uh, 100, 250 children, there are very strong individual differences amongst children. And we keep that in mind. So what predicted liking? Well, it was not adding sugar and it was not adding oil. Plain artichoke was absolutely sufficient to increase intake. And what was it that predicted the eating pattern of um, not eating or eating at all? Well, the non-eaters were older. So it's easier to persuade a younger child to eat the vegetable rather than older children. And the non-eaters were high in satiety responsiveness and high in food fussiness. So the children who ate the most tended to be the younger ones, so the 12 month olds. Um, and the ones who refused were the older ones, so um, 30 months or so. So finally, I just want to talk you through some studies that we've done with preschool children, where it's not just about repeated exposure, but rather looking at whether nutrition education is useful and whether or not teaching about a specific vegetable that you want the child to eat, whether it matters how you present it in a storybook, or uh, as part of nutrition education or as sensory play. So just to remind everyone, most children do not eat enough vegetables. Many are unwilling to taste a new vegetable. 
And nutrition education is used very widely, but actually has very small effects compared to repeated exposure. So our question was, if children are taught about familiar vegetables, does it matter uh, that it's an unfamiliar vegetable or a familiar vegetable? So we did some studies looking at nutrition education. And we also did some studies where we looked at storybook. So we created a storybook uh, featuring a novel vegetable and we taught our preschool children about this new vegetable. In this case, we taught them about celeriac because we figured that celeriac would be an unusual vegetable for children to eat, especially raw. And we also had some sensory learning. So the children got to play with the vegetables, either the celeriac or the control vegetable, which is the, the carrots. And we asked the question, well, does sensory learning with the novel vegetable increase intake? And do the storybooks featuring that novel vegetable increase intake? We also looked at willingness to try. So if children had had the storybook, were they more willing to try this novel vegetable? So just to give you an idea of what the storybooks look like, here they are, the knobbly, wobbly, bobbly celeriac and the control condition, which was the knobbly, wobbly, bobbly carrot. And we use carrot as a control vegetable because generally children, preschool children, like carrots and they're exposed to carrots. But celeriac tends to be a novel vegetable and one that's not ten doesn't tend to be eaten raw. So we have a, a narrative around the celeriac uh, based on um, uh, 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 two children, Alex and Morgan. They go to the greengrocer with their mum Monday to Friday. They choose a different vegetable for their tea every night. And finally, they pick and they eat the celeriac or the knobbly wobbly bobbly celeriac. And there's a lot of rhyme included in this. And Funky Foods have done a really nice job of including lots of different learning um, options such as, as I said, rhyming, but also, um, you know, uh, useful information and, and sort of making the story educational as well as a lot of fun. And uh, we also then had um, story time in our nurseries where uh, our nursery teachers were explaining about celeriac and doing the stories every day. And the storybook was on display for the children to go and look at at their leisure. And we also had um, play, play with the celeriac. So here's a whole celeriac, half a celeriac, sliced celeriac, sticks, spiralized and grated. The children loved the spiralized vegetables. It just couldn't stop playing with the spiralized. That was very popular. So we used um, the sensory play to listen to the sound of the vegetable when we touch it and we knock it and looking at the vegetable, smelling the vegetable, and then touching the vegetable. So in a way, we're kind of building them up in the same way that we would in psychology. If someone has a phobia of a spider, for example, we get them to very gradually build up to the, to the point of touching um, the fear object. So we're treating this a bit like a fear object. And here they are, um, play, children are playing with the carrots and with the spiralized uh, vegetables. And finally, here we have them tasting the celeriac. So they've been reading about the celeriac, they've been touching the celeriac, they've been smelling the celeriac, and finally we have the celeriac tasting. So what do we find in this experiment? Well, first thing to note is a lot of children did not eat any celeriac before we did the storybook and sensory play. However, when we have the storybook and the sensory play, the biggest jump in intake of the celeriac occurs. And if the storybook is just about carrots, then there's not a big increase in how much is consumed. But even getting the children to play with, uh, with the, the celeriac does help a little bit to increase willingness to try. And then amongst those children who did not eat celeriac at pretest, if they were in a storybook, at least they ate about a gram. So they were interested in trying a little bit. And if they had the sensory play and the, the storybook, then they had at least four grams consumed, which is not a lot, but it's more than they had at baseline, where they were really not willing to try the celeriac. So the books encourage familiarity telling them about the celeriac, being able to recognise a celeriac, knowing what a celeriac is. Sensory play encourages willingness to try because they're now familiar with the smell, the, the, the smell, the look, the sound of the vegetable. 
And if the books are congruent with the vegetable, that is, the storybook is the same as the sensory play, then this is very effective increasing intake. But even any sensory play seems to help children to be willing to taste a new vegetable. So sensory play is important. So in conclusion, just to wrap all this up, my first message is infants dislike bitter from birth. And that's a problem for some types of foods. So vegetables are slightly bitter. So they need greater effort than other foods to be included in the repertoire of children. Vegetables are advocated now as a first food during complementary feeding because this is the time, six months of age, when babies are most willing to try these new foods. Once they get their um, experience of very sweet foods, then it's harder to introduce vegetables because by comparison, vegetables are just not as tasty. Um, but we know that if you repeatedly expose yourself to a flavour, I mean, for example, coffee is bitter, beer is bitter, dark chocolate is bitter, but with repeated exposure and persistence, we learn to like those uh, flavours. So bitterness can be liked with repeated exposure, but in our studies, adding sugar didn't help adding oil didn't help. So the plain flavour is what you need to give to children, make it distinctive. So children learn best through taste exposure, but storybooks encourage awareness uh, of what these vegetables are so that it's not so fearful if they can recognise the vegetable and become familiar. And sensory play reduces that fear around new foods and encourages exploration and acceptance. So Francis, that's all I have to say, and I'm, I'm very willing to take any questions. That's wonderful, Marianne. Thank you very much. That was really, really interesting. Um, we do have a, a few questions for you, but um, if it's okay with you, I'm just going to go through some of the um, sources of information and the resources that we have on Food of Fact of Life, and then I'll come back to you at the end if that's okay. Yeah. Super, thank you. So I uh, just very quickly just want to let everybody know about the resources that we have available on the Food of Facts of Life website. And um, there's a number of resources that would help support teaching and learning about vegetables, along with lots of other things. So healthy eating, cooking, where food comes from. But these are ones I just thought might be particularly interesting. So we have an area specifically for three to five years. And then we've also got five to seven, seven to 11 and so on. But within the three to five years, you'll find um, 10 food-based sessions, which are um, little activities to do with food and getting actually sort of practical experience with preparation and um, making foods in primary schools and particularly in nursery schools. So with that, there is a session plan, a tasting guide, recipes and activities. And then we have um, Learn With Stories, which links in nicely with what Marion's been uh, discussing during the webinar. And with the Learn With Stories, there are teacher's guides, presentation, worksheets, and interactive whiteboard activities. We've also got Where Food Comes From cards. So they're quite nice. They actually show the stages of, from farm to fork and the children can look at where, they, where and how the foods are grown and actually how they end up when they're cooked and on their plate. And then we have vegetable cards as well. And then we also have some fun interactive games as well. So this one particularly is a fruit and vegetable bingo game. So um, I would recommend that you have a look at Food of Fact of Life just to see what sort of resources are on there that might be able to uh, help you with your teaching and learning about vegetables. And also I've put together a list of other resources and sources of information that you might find useful. And these are taken from the British Nutrition Foundation sort of main website, which is nutrition.org.uk. And uh, there's one particular area which is encouraging children to eat vegetables. And we've got something else on introducing solid foods. And then a new resource uh, which has been updated, if it hasn't been updated now, it's going to be very shortly, which is 5532 a day, perfect portions for toddler tums. And we've got feeding toddlers and preschool children, and then children nutrition and diet information. So a wide variety of information that you might find useful. So before we uh, go back to Maureen with some 
sorry, Marion with some questions. Um, just want to thank you for joining us this afternoon. And in a moment, you'll be redirected to the evaluation and then you'll be able to download your certificate. But um, the next webinars that we're going to be having are um, in, on the 26th of June, food literacy versus food skills. And then also another one, which is the quality calorie concept, because a healthy diet is about both quality and quantity. And both of those are 8 p.m. in the evening. And you'll find out uh, further information and uh, the area to book on Food Effects of Life again in the training area. So, Marianne, we have a few questions if you're able to answer them. So, first one is, uh, how can parents identify whether a baby is disliking food or just processing a new flavor? Are there any top tips? Well, uh, that's a very good uh, question. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Um, so, um, effectively, when a baby is first given a food, they will show, as I, I illustrated on the slides, um, some really very negative looking facial expressions. But what I thought I also conveyed was that with a little bit of persistence, you'll find that the baby will eventually like the flavor. However, after maybe eight to 10 exposures and the baby still is showing these very negative um, facial responses, I think we can be confident that after 10 exposures, this is a food the child simply does not like. Now, having said that and working in this field, you'll be sure that I've got colleagues who've got a different story. And one of them is Dr. Jo Cecil at St. Andrews University who works with me very closely. And she was determined that her son would like uh, cucumbers. So after 10 exposures, he still didn't like cucumbers. And one day I got a phone call from her and said, this is the 17th time she's tried the cucumber and now he likes it. <laughs> so I don't know if that's really good advice, which is 17 exposures, but certainly now he absolutely loves cucumbers, he's fine. But I would say that eight, 10 separate exposures and if the baby is, or child is still showing negative responses, turning their head away, screwing up their face, um, you know, really showing uh, aversive responses, do not proceed because it makes it unpleasant for you as the mum and it makes it unpleasant for the baby and it's not that important to switch to a different vegetable. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, there's another question from Rebecca. So Rebecca says, thank you for presenting your fabulous research. Very informative and great to support anyone working to increase vegetable intake in infants and children. Do you feel parental confidence plays a part in infants and children accepting vegetables and have you ever investigated this? Well, that's another very good question about parental confidence. It's not something that we have um, investigated specifically, but what was a surprise to us when we did our study with vegetables in milk and then rice was that the mum said that their favourite part of the whole experience was not the vegetables added to milk or rice, because that was a bit of a faff, but their favourite part was when we gave them the training in how to look at um, refusals, and that three refusals was enough to stop feeding the child. And it made us think that even though this was only done to help the mums um, in an experiment to stop feeding children um, when we knew that the child was now refusing it, we discovered that really this was a resource we had to build. So we now have a resource for responsive feeding. We've got it on YouTube. If anyone would like to see it, then uh, please contact me through Francis and I can send the link. But effectively, we, um, we, uh, we, we do think that parents would build their confidence more from having a bit of information because not everybody realizes how wise babies are. And the other thing is that when uh, a baby is very young, they're very wise and trying to get a new food into a child who's a bit older is always going to be a challenge. And I think if parents have that knowledge, it, it will help their confidence a bit more. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then another one, we've just got time for another couple I think if that's all right with you yeah. um, is there any influence from getting young children to cook with the family and preference of vegetables 
This is a, a great question as well. There have been a couple of studies now that are published looking at the influence of cooking with children. And unfortunately, the data are very mixed. Most of the studies do not show any um, increase in liking of the vegetables as a function of cooking. However, it is true to say that the studies show that there's more enjoyment when there's cooking together as a family and eating together as a family. So there's um, good evidence in relation to healthy eating in a general way and also um, prevention of later overweight and obesity in relation to eating family meals. But the data from the cooking with children and even growing vegetables with children is very mixed. So I can't be confident in telling you the outcome of that research because some studies show some small effect. Most studies show no effect on food preference. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I think we've got time for one more. So um, this one is, uh, do we miss a window of opportunity if exposure doesn't take place in early infancy? How old is too old? That's a, 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 it's a great question, one that I have grappled with. Um, the clear answer to that is that because we are working with preschool children uh, with novel vegetables, clearly that window of opportunity hasn't passed because these were children who were not given celery uh, uh, during weaning and during the solid food introduction phase. However, I would say that by the time children are at school and so uh, from five and above, it is just simply more challenging. And those school-based studies that I mentioned at the very beginning of the webinar, they were very well conducted and they involved lots of resources. And I put the resources up on the slide from my own study, which was Food Standards Agency funded research using um, five a day, the Bass Street way, because we were in Dundee, where the Bass Street are really very popular. And it's, the teachers were very, very good at in introducing the materials to the children. So their awareness was good, they understood and the knowledge was high, but the behaviour was, was not. And therefore, the most important message from all of this is that tasting matters, repeated exposure matters, and it might be never too late to learn, but most studies show that it's much, much more challenging as children get older. Okay, thank you. Um, so I said that was the last one. We do actually have one more and then I think we do need to finish. Um, although it's been really fascinating, thank you. So last question, um, I'm seeing many under fives who are not eating whole food groups or foods with particular textures, wet, soggy food texture foods. There, is there any support out there to help these families with extreme food refusal? There is support for extreme food refusal. There's, um, a, there are specialist feeding disorder clinics around the country. The one that springs to mind is the one that is run by Dr. Gillian Harris in the, at the University of Birmingham. And in Jill Harris's practice, she typically sees children who are food refusers. And uh, earlier I said that food fussiness is highly heritable. However, it's not incurable and therefore there are ways to encourage children to eat a, a variety of foods. But she is a specialist psychologist who deals with food refusal and it is very laborious and very um, uh, time intensive. But that specialist help is there for children who are avoiding entire food groups because after all, those children are likely at risk of hidden hunger and micronutrient deficiency. So really need to have some specialist support. Thank you, that's, uh, that's really helpful. Thank you very much. So we've had a couple of people asking for the YouTube link, Marion. So is that something you'd be able to let me have and then I can pass it on? Um, I'd rather do it directly. So if we can get the information from the participants, I can then, because uh, I need to be able to control that link. Okay, but okay, it's the, that's it's fine. The password okay. protected, okay. Yeah. Okay, we'll sort that out then. Thank, thank you. you. So thank you very much once again, Marion. It's been a really interesting webinar. And um, thank you everybody for taking part. And we'll end the meeting now. And hopefully you'll be directed to the evaluation. And uh, we'll see you again next time. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, Marion.